This is an interesting pairing, this panel. Um, it's becoming more and more interesting as I was listening to Lisa's uh, comments. Um, I think we're both really thinking in these cross-disciplinary ways um, and really trying to struggle with the kind of tensions around thinking cross, in cross-disciplinary ways. I'm actually making a defensive realism, <laughs> uh, literary realism, epistemological realism, and political realism, um, some kind of maybe unpopular things. Um, but I hope that people can hear the kind of ambivalence and cross currents that are that are in there and and the affinities I think with what you're with what you're doing so um, what I want to suggest today is that recent debates about reading methods post-critical post hermeneutic reading methods have consequences for the field of affect studies that is obvious I think when we think about reading practices that center affect that are about affect so reparative reading would be probably the biggest most obvious example but we can also think about fandom, overreading, empathy, witness and post-witness as affectively charged, but also um, the kind of negative, the absence of affect in some work on reading methods that are more about technique, not ethos, that feature uh, low affect, um, technical protocols, and so on, detached. Okay, so beyond this question about the sheer presence of affect or its absence, other points I think are relevant um, to these cons to the to the to the field other points that have come up in relation to reading methods are relevant for the field now <laughs> Not surprisingly. I'm going to focus on some of the concerns that are uh, at the center of my own current research project But I'm thinking about things like description observation and questions of scale and in particular um, The kind of ambivalence around small-scale work, which I think we face when we work on affect um, and the subject so I became interested in affect studies, my version of affect studies, as a descriptive practice. I felt like I was slipping away from tighter conceptual structures, from strong theory to weaker theories, to be, able, to be able to account for how things are and how they feel, for the everyday, for nonce and proliferating taxonomies. The influence of Sedgwick and people influenced by Sedgwick is clear for me. I know this isn't everyone's affect studies, but it's been mine. Because of how this interest in the everyday crosses with my persistent interest in negative affect, there's always been the risk in the kind of work that I do in the reduplication of the world rather than the transformation of it. There's the political realism, the depressive realism. I see a political significance in simply saying things are fucked up. But I think my own current work about description asking questions like, what is critical description? Can there be a politics of description? Pushes on questions that came for me out of affect studies. So I hope you hear those connections too. All right, there's an epigraph to this paper from George Levine, a uh, Victorianist critic of the novel, his book, The Realist Imagination. He writes, at the risk of ideological and metaphysical complicity with things as they are, criticism must behave at times as though something is really out there after all. These are not questions of either or, one is not either for realism or against it, as though this were a football game or a war. Realism posits mixed conditions. So do I. Several re recent contributions to debates about reading methods and the relation between critique and politics focus on questions of scale. In 2011, Mark Seltzer referred to some recent work in literary and cultural studies as an example of the new incrementalism. Seltzer describes the incrementalist turn in criticism as, quote, a turn toward the minor and the scaled down. Hence, for example, with respect to the novel, there is a turn to the study of minor characters. With respect to affect, minor feelings. With respect to political forms, little resistances, infantile subjects, minute therapeutic adjustments. With respect to perception, the decelerated gaze, and a prolonged atten attentiveness, and so on. Seltzer's attitude toward what he called one downsmanship is rueful but not exactly condemnatory. He writes, quote, there's a good deal to be said for the opening to small moments of unaccountability and even perhaps for the uses of such an epistemological therapeutics and the political minimalism that goes with it. It is for one thing more attuned to the institutional situation of literary and cultural forms and their way of acting in the world than the maximalist, maximalist claims of transnational and transchronological turns, which seem at times to assume the literalism of a direct political or emancipatory impact on the world, or even past worlds, time travel. 
Seltzer's ambivalent diagnosis of the state of contemporary criticism reframes a long history of anxiety about the role and significance of literary and cultural criticism as a matter of scale. The defunding of universities and of the humanities in the early 21st century underlines questions about the relation between the liberal arts and public life. In response to this new burden of justification, as well as a perceived incursion of scientific protocols and methods into literary studies, many scholars have responded by shoring up the aesthetic, ethical, and political value of literature and of critical modes of response to it. Others have responded to the same threat by scaling down claims about the impact of scholarship, countering claims for the efficacy of criticism by counseling humility or the acknowledgement of the limits of critical agency. Responses to the political minimalism of some recent criticism have been divided, to say the least. Does the reduction in scale constitute a necessary interrogation of the place of criticism, or is it rather a capitulation to the limited horizon of the present, one that endorses the violence of the given? Um, so new incrementalism clearly uh, reflects the conditions of the world with downsizing um, as the kind of key uh, economic uh, for, um, kind of description that we might want to apply there, but um, whether such a mimetic response to the conditions of the present can only be seen as a failure of political courage isn't clear. In a response to cruel optimism, Berlant's cruel optimism, Sien Nai argues for the political value of the incrementalist turn, responding specifically to Seltzer. Nye sees Berlant's turn to minor and diffuse affects as informed by political commitments responsive to the conditions of the present. Nye argues, quote, scale down affects are the ones that best register the only seemingly paradoxical becoming ordinary of social, political, and environmental crisis. She argues that cruel optimism's focus on more ambient and diffused feelings is, quote, metapolitical in a Ranciarian sense. That is to say, it tries to imagine a non-sovereign politics rather than simply stepping back from politics altogether. Now, as Nye's brief defense of Berlant's cruel optimism suggests, the incrementalist turn and claims about its political valence are relevant to the field of affect studies, and I would add to feminism. When it comes to claims, size matters. <laughs> and I think we could do more to talk about the gender dimensions of recent debates about method. But um, I think that also, it's also relevant just for affect studies in the sense that um, uh, discussions of the small scale of criticism do implicate us. Um, so basically, um, I want to think about this question of the politics of scale and a kind of descriptive politics um, in this paper. And I basically have sort of three sites that I want to talk about briefly. So the first one is microsociology, and that's what I've been working on uh, for the last several years. Um, the second one, I wanted to talk briefly about literary realism, but I think I'm going to kind of shut, like, again, sort of, uh, give short shrift to my own discipline and just sort of summarize that. And finally, I wanted to turn to a literary example, I think resonant for many of us, which is Claudia Rankin's 2014 Citizen and American Lyric, to think about this question of the politics of description and the politics of the micro. All right, so microsociology. Um, I'm going to quote this um, scholar, uh, Robert Emerson, who's talking about Chicago-style sociological fieldwork in an essay called Ethnography, Interaction, and Ordinary Trouble. Um, and he's basically making a defense of interaction rich as opposed to interaction impoverished microsocial work, um, which um, gives us a kind of uh, granular attention to the everyday and to everyday differences and squabbles, the kind of low level troubles um, that make up ordinary experience. And Emerson talks about this actually in terms of his teaching, um, the difficulty of getting students in his courses to attend to the smallest scales of experiences. So he says people come in wanting to talk about gender, class, class race, and sorry, ethnicity, um, but with little interest in the interactional processes through which these social phenomena are expressed. Um, so he's trying to get them to access the macro through the micro um, to suggest that these can be, you can talk about them in exactly this way. Um, so it's a kind of account of the trade-offs of macro and micro research. Um, but uh, I would say, as a kind of defense of the politics of the micro, it's a little bit troubling, uh, actually, because the example that he ends up using is roommate troubles, right? So, and he says, you know, this is a situation that's not necessarily marked by, um, you know, power inequalities and so on. It really is, uh, he's really doing a kind of microsocial analysis of complaints about noise, disagreements about washing the dishes, and so on, right? Um, so 
it is descriptively rich, but it definitely raises the question of why we need this much fine-grained information about non-dramatic, non-consequential aspects um, of, everyday, of everyday life. Okay, so that's sort of one uh, case. Now, I think in, in terms of literary realism, I do kind of want to um, shorten this quite a bit um, and just say that um, in the tradition of novel criticism, there's been, I think, um, a long-standing tension, a quite long-standing tension about uh, the risk that realism represents simply a transcription and therefore an endorsement of the world as it is. So we can look back to uh, Lukács' um, classic essay, Narrate or Describe, where um, description is, uh, you know, and he points to Zola, um, is an example of tr the, a way of treating social problems as social facts, as results, as caput mortuum of a social process. Um, George Levine, who I quoted at the outset, offers a more positive assessment of 19th century realism um, in which he suggests that the kind of anti-literary bias of realism, that's to say get, getting um, reality down on the page, has a lot of value and that the whole idea of naive realism um, is a kind of simplification of a much more complex representational process. So uh, Levine acknowledges the ideological risk of the form, which he describes as metaphysical complicity with things as they are, but sees uh, realism as um, pushing back against uh, again, sort of large-scale abstract concepts um, with a kind of insistence on reality as it's lived. And he cites Thackeray, um, uh, again, thinking about sort of ordinary troubles. This is Thackeray, it's not what you lose, but what you have daily to bear that is hard. Uh, but the concern that is that in registering discontent with what is mixed, compromised, contingent, unfair, realist novels teach their readers to bear with the social world rather than to change it. This, probably not surprising, uh, leads up to Jameson, right? And um, so I have a kind of reading here of The Antinomies of Realism, Jameson's 2013 book, where he is, I think, struggling again with this sort of age-old uh, question. And Jameson um, uh, uh, contrasts what he calls ontological realism, a form of realism absolutely committed to the density and solidity of what is to providential realism, okay? And uh, providential realism uh, is a kind of realism that is open to what he calls the providential drifts within the existent, okay? Um, and scale is quite important to Jameson in the sense. So he uses Middlemarch as an example, and you know, he says Middlemarch sort of flirts with the dangers of ontological realism getting kind of trapped in the existent, but because of its scale, because of its scope, it uh, kind of opens on to the so uh, larger social world and um, opens up these kind of what he calls providential sparks and fires um, within, the, within the real. Okay, so these providential sparks and fires, which Jameson sees in the best kind of realism, um, are conspicuously lacking from social science treatments of the ordinary. In this work, there is no miraculous transformation, no joyous discrediting of the reality principle. So the microsociologists really run this risk of uh, simply describing observable reality um, and being aligned with a wholly imminent realism, okay? Um, and so this, um, uh, but I think, you know, again, sort of thinking back through George Levine and his critique of Jameson, um, this kind of uh, insistence on the real for Levine, he suggests, pushes back against the, the danger of transcendence um, and that by focusing on concrete actuality, one registers the intransigence of reality, its uh, uh, refusal to line up with our conceptual schemas or desires for transformation. Okay, so my final place I wanna end up is just in a brief treatment of um, Claudia Rankin's 2014 book, Citizen, an American Lyric. Um, and I know this is a book that many people here are thinking about. John Steen is giving a paper on it later today. Probably other people, I would guess, at this conference are thinking about this, writing about it. Um, and I think, you know, it, there's been a sort of close link to affect studies, uh, like thinking about Lauren Berlant's interview with Claudia Rankin and Baum, uh, which starts with her approaching Rankin in the parking lot and saying, um, I think we see the same thing, right? So 
you know, I think people are thinking about this text in the context of, of affect studies, um, but I do want to put it in conversation with this kind of microsociological tradition, okay? So that's, that's the sort of shift that I want to make in thinking about citizen. Um, so Rankin's flat, detailed account of everyday racism through fleeting small-scale events, um, which is how this, this book operates, um, resonates with distributed practices of critique that have emerged in media spheres, Twitter and Tumblr, and in particular with um, the reporting of microaggressions, right, or this sort of calling out of microaggressions. Not all the aggressions in Citizen are micro, for sure. The book consistently troubles the line between spectacular and quotidian forms of violence. And in some cases, like in the discussion of John Henryism, um, the medical term uh, for people exposed to stress stemming from racism, Rankin draws literal connections between minor events and major consequences. But the thing that interests me is that even when Rankin is thinking about uh, spectacular violence, she accesses it, accesses it through the smallest scale, um, tracking gestures, comments, and glances that turn quotidian social worlds into arenas for the perpetuation of violence. Uh, the banality of these encounters is crucial to Rankin's um, work, right? They happen everywhere on a subway platform in the driveway, standing in line. So just to give you a, an example, um, for people who aren't familiar with the text, um, there's a scene in Starbucks, okay? Um, which I think the point is to mine both the violence and the intimacy within this bland public setting. So uh, this is, in this scene, a man employs a racial epithet, just in relation to some teenagers, and this is what, how Rankin writes the scene. He is holding the lidded paper cup in one hand and a small paper bag in the other. They are just being kids. Come on, no need to get all KKK on them, you say. Now there you go, he responds. The people around you have turned away from their screens. The teenagers are on pause. There I go, you ask, feeling irritation begin to rain down. Yes, and something about hearing yourself repeating this stranger's accusation in a voice usually reserved for your partner makes you smile. <laughs> so Rankin's flat style of reportage is an evidence here. She uses transcri transcribed dialogue and stage directions to indicate setting and <laughs> physical action. Um, there's a metaphorical lyric language, you know, the irritation compared to, compared to rain. I think the lidded... Yeah. Uh, the, the lidded cup recalling hooded robes, but um, she also uses a kind of, uh, I think the metaphorical language is, is kind of um, uh, subsumed under a, a more general category of a kind of blank description. And I think this is the crucial thing about Rankin's work is that um, she gives us a kind of external gaze and I think there's an ethics of not projecting into the scene but there's also an intimacy there because she's kind of asking the reader to do the projection. So it's an interesting mix of a kind of, um, and this is something that Rankin's talked about a lot in various venues, um, the kind of ethics of an internal, external description, but one that also invites a more intimate form of reading. So reviews of Citizen have often talked about it in relation to new media forms, that's kind of unavoidable, but also other non-fictional genres. Um, in The New Yorker, Dan Chiasun calls talks about it as a police log or a journal entry. Um, people have also focused on, I think importantly, on the, fig the second person, the use of the second person. Um, and I think just to note, you know, this you has a lot less to do with like the you of lyric poetry than something like the you, um, you know, on the witness stand or something like that, a kind of procedural you. As Erica Hunt writes in the Los Angeles Review of Books, this you is, quote, at times a stick figure, at other times the keen observer collecting evidence. So, you know, I really want to focus, I really want to point out the kind of um, interest in non-literary forms um, and in particular in technologically mediated, mediated observation and surveillance. Rankine turns the flat gaze of the camera on her subject matter uh, engaging in painstaking frame-by-frame -frame analysis of small-scale scenes of social interactions, basically a kind of microsociological method. The analog that uh, Dan Chiasen locates in Citizen uh, for this meticulous scrutiny is the set of technologies used to assess referee calls in tennis, right? So there's a long reading in the book of Serena Williams um, and sort of her place in the world of tennis. Um, and um, 
both uh, traditional, you know, he's thinking about traditional slow motion replays and the Hawkeye line calling technology that was installed a year after the notorious string of bad calls against Serena Williams in a 2004 US Open match. According to Rankine in, her, in, in Citizen, she writes, this technology, quote, took the seeing away from the beholder, which in this case was a good thing, right? Dealing with racist, hostile, and unfair judges. Now, <laughs> I don't think we can think about um, surveillance technology of this kind um, in the context of thinking about racial violence without thinking about the history of surveillance and, and the violence that it's done, particularly the seeding of authority to technological apparatus coded as neutral, right? So I wanna, I wanna signal that, but I also think in this case, the Hawkeye line judge is a kind of heroic figure and a sort of analog um, for the uh, narrating voice, okay? Um, this exterior gaze that Rankin uses um, doesn't always focus on what she calls the, quote, meanings behind the retreating seconds. Instead, she focuses on the precise look of the ball hitting the line or hitting just beyond it. Through identifying herself with the camera rather than with a traditional expressive lyric eye, Rankin turns a cold eye on racial violence. Her analysis stays at the micro level, fascinated by the details of racial violence and committed to documenting the existent. Slowing her analysis down, playing these scenes frame by frame, Rankin suggests that the micro scale is not inherently conservative and that exactitude is a crucial political recourse. Um, although Rankin takes some distance from micro genres on the web and the microaggression discourse, um, I think we do have to read her work in relation to um, another very important uh, moment of, um, of what has been called, what Simone Brown in her recent work on racial surveillance quotes Steve Mann on, the idea of surveillance, right? Not valence or watching from above, but watching from below, right? And the use of cell phone camera and so on to actually do the crucial work of documentation um, in the present. I think we have a different, we need to really incorporate that into how we think about the scale of the micro and how we think about practices of documentation. Um, so these tactics suggest that politics can work through other means than by moving out to the broadest, biggest, furthest horizon. Rankin points us instead toward a politics of the imminent, of the everyday, and the close at hand. Thank you.